We're thrilled that we have Eric Schmidt here, who is the executive chairman and former CEO of Google. Thank you so much for coming and for the friendship of Google to UCLA Anderson. Well, UCLA is fantastic. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. So we're going to talk about leadership. And you went, I'm sure, through a learning curve and transition coming from Novell to a company that had 150 people. And by the time you left the CEO role, over 50,000 people. How did your leadership philosophy and actual actions change? Well, I learned a lot from our founders. And one of the things I learned was ask the impossible and really dream big. And what you learn about people is if you paint a very broad vision, you attract people who really want to make it happen because they're dreamers too. So you can inspire people. And with that inspiration, you get the, the smartest people and they deal with a lot of stuff. But can an organization like Google, which espouses the idea that you're going to give people in the organization 15 or 20% of their time to do almost anything they want in terms of innovation, can that system work in smaller companies? Can that system work in any company? Is that a leadership tenant that can work across a broad range of companies? Well, in fact, it worked at Google when Google was tiny. Right. So the answer is yes, it does work in small companies. Remember, we give this to engineers, and engineers are not that clever, right? If they're going to work on something in their 20% time, it's going to be something that's pretty related to their training and their knowledge. And that's why it's so powerful. Uh, very, very few people sort of get off the reservation and do something completely different from technology and so forth. And if they did, we would encourage it. Has something manifest that you can recall come from just that kind of incubation? Virtually all of the interesting apps now came from a combination of an acquisition and a 20% time. If you look at Maps, if you look at Google Earth, if you look at Chrome and Android, all of them came from somebody trying something, identifying something, and then we would say, we have all these 20% timers, but we need a real group. Right. And the fastest way to do that was to create a real group or buy a company. In your book, you talk about the fact that when you came to Google with these 150 people, it was pretty chaotic. Uh, and yet you talk about the fact that you want people to have take moonshots, be ultra creative. How did you bring some order into the environment, into the company, and at the same time preserve that golden nugget of creativity and imagination? You know, every executive has this goal of order, and we had a goal of disorder that was orderly, right? That w what we said was, just keep doing your thing, but tell us what you're doing, let's monitor it, let's kind of fix it. One day we discovered we had too many projects, and so we said, let's have a top 100. And of course, there were 300 projects on it involving 60 people, which is, of course, crazy. But we could never get the list down to 100. We got it down to 200. So it was that iterative process, that constant questioning that did it. But usually in companies, there's a notion of a hierarchy, a set of objectives, a quarterly plan, and so forth. We had none of that. Our theory was that the leadership, in particular the bottoms-up leadership, really should be empowered by what we were doing, and we'd see how far they get. We didn't have an 18-month strategy. We just kept iterating. So what I learned from this is that fast iteration is the key. The most important thing to do is every week, a new product, a new idea, just keep pushing. You'd be amazed how much progress you make in three months or six months. How does a, a CEO, um, what unique resources and talents do you have to use, and I'm not talking about the technology, but the emotional technology, if you will, to deal with founders who started the thing, incubated the thing, and, and you come in and be the CEO. How do you balance those two? How do you not make them surrender the magic, you know, for the, for the, for the madness of getting it done? How do you balance that? What are the, what's the secret sauce in that process? The most important thing to remember, it's their company, not yours. If you think you were brought in to be the CEO, to run the company, to tell them what to do, you've misread the situation. They are the owners, they are the founders, you're there to get their vision to happen, which means you have to constantly be talking about what their vision is. If they think that you're implementing their vision, then they'll put up with you and put up with all the processes and all that kind of stuff. If they think you're blocking their vision, you're toast. Does that scale down to in terms of leadership as it gets below them? Is your leadership, do you look at other leadership styles or is there one leadership style that you think the the organization has to have as it goes through the whole organization? I think what we figured out was that in a product-based business, which is what Google is, 
There are leaders who are uniquely talented to lead these product groups. And over and over again, over years and years, we would say that the core problem we have is we need a particular kind of person. Let me describe that. It's a person who's pretty technical, knows how to ship products, understands the market, and understands the strategy. All the people who didn't fit that were put in secondary roles. But if you could find somebody who really wanted to do Chrome or really wanted to do Android, right, we would say, go for it. But you'd check on them. But they'd be able to say, this is the strategy, these are the competitors, this is the technological opportunity, and they see where they're going and they can tell you and they're going to work, they're going to work for you doing it whether you ask them or not. They're so committed to it. It's that product vision and the ability to implement it that is the differentiation. So this gets us to the hiring process and uh, as, as much as you want disorderly order to reign, um, you do have now a very structured interview process. I know about that from our students who get hired by Google. Many, many uh, levels and iterations. So you look for smart creatives, you talk about that, uh, in a very actually structured process. So, so talk about how you do that. One of the key things that we discovered is that recruiting and hiring can be systematized and measured. So here's an example. We would have people grade the candidates. And because some people grade higher, you know, they only give fours to fives, and other people grade really low, you know, ones to twos, we would take their grades and then normalize them mathematically so they're all comparable. We would then a year later go back and look back and see how predictive they were. And we would give the interviewers feedback as to whether they were good interviewers or not based on the actual performance. So my point is, and that's just one of many things that we did, the other thing we did is we focused very much on grade point averages and on top schools and, and academic excellence. We were heavily criticized for that because after all, people had people they'd worked with and they'd say, oh, you know, this is a great Java programmer or this is a great IT specialist and these are functions that we needed. But they didn't have that requisite background. And we found that by hiring sort of general purpose intellectual people, people who just had a lot going for them in various ways, that helped us because the mission always changed. There was always a new product, a new service, a new challenge. How do you, with all these the huge business you have, huge company you have, it's Google. How do you not make it gaggle with so many different people all over the, all over the world, really? How do you create a cohesive uh, strategic vision? Is that something you constantly try to carve and monitor, or is it already set from the very first time that, that it was injected into the, into the uh, oyster, so to speak? Well, first place, it's really set by the founders when they set that original co company, right. and you don't need to write it down. Right. At some point, we, you have to write it down. So one day I said to Larry and Sergey said, look, we need to have a strategy. Right. So we sat in their office. They had one office working together. And I wrote down on the whiteboard the strategy where, and Larry and I agreed to it, and Sergey decided to go play volleyball. So he would run in and out sort of between playing volleyball, and he'd make these brilliant ideas, and then he'd run back out. And that was our strategy process, and it worked. So we unveiled that as our strategy. Without the volleyball. Yeah, <laughs> but the point is, it, whatever it took, right? Right. And we recognized what our strengths were, where we thought we could go, and so forth. And that's what created the modern. And is that vision, that strategy today, with all of the businesses that Google is in, a way for you to say, we are going to get into this product and we're not going to get into this product? I think it's evolved. Uh, when the company was smaller, it was sort of understandable as search plus, right? Mm -hmm. Today, the company has broadened its, its appetite, its vision, into doing many, many things, which we're very proud of. And we, in fact, organized a group uh, called Google X to do things which were moonshots. And Sergey made this observation originally. Mathematically, he proved that the correct organization, I don't remember the math, was 70% of your company working on normal, traditional things, 20% working on adjacent businesses, and 10% working on other, things which were very high risk that might work out and might not. And that's what led to the creation of Google X. But the majority of the company is run relatively traditionally. They have vice presidents of engineering, they have product plans, and so forth. And the teams are relatively large. And, and, and that 90%, if you will, is pretty coherently organized around a vision that tells you, yes, we are going to get into cars, and we're not going to get into drones. So, so the 90% is really about information technology, mm -hmm and making sure that Google is a significant participation in the evolution of the internet. Uh, in mo mobile, it's obviously the Android platform. 
We've done a great deal of work to make networks faster. And of course, the back end, we have a series of, of cloud-based services. We're working on machine learning and all of these things. So speaking as a computer scientist, our goal was to have a piece of Google in kind of every transaction, just trying to help out, trying to be there. And that puts us in a strong position to eventually build businesses that are al aligned with that. But our core business remains search. Our core revenue comes from ads. And that's where our, literally the, the, the bread is buttered. I'd like to ask you a, question, a general question for all businesses. If you were coaching a, a business class or a, a company, uh, how does a company remain nimble today? What does it have to do to remain nimble? My problem with most strategy conversations is that they're always inward out. You know, we establish, well, first, we're the best in the world because everybody thinks that, which can't possibly be true. And second, we see that all of our products are going to be successful, and therefore, we'll be very successful in the future. And that's usually how strategy is done in businesses. I prefer a completely different approach. Work very, very, very hard to figure out what the world's going to look like in five years. What will people be doing? What will your customers want? Where will costs be, will be? In our case, what will networks look like? How important will phones be? What will the apps look like? What services? And spend an awful lot of time on that. And then take a look at your offerings. What are the strongest ones? Which are the ones that are going to iterate quickly? You're probably going to do fine there. You understand those businesses. What about these others? Uh, if you think about in the media business, there are business, media businesses that are going very well and others that are in great trouble. This is completely predicted five years ago. right? So the leaders in the ones that are in trouble should have right, done a five-year plan and said, holy cow, what are we going to do? What are the things we do? Or maybe we sell ourselves or we try something different. But almost all of these strategic shifts are predictable using my, my five-year model. Almost nobody does a five-year plan. Most businesses do a one to two-year plan. Especially you know, in your space. Especially in our space, but even in most businesses. The only business that I discovered that does a five-year or longer plan is the oil and gas industry. And the reason is because they have to deploy so much capital and do all this planning. But even there, they have trouble because the prices go up and down and so forth. So even there, it's difficult. So last question. What does an executive chairman do? Well, the good news is, <laughs> the good news is that you work it out with the CEO. So um, I've been executive chairman for four years. It's a great job, by the way. And 10 years as CEO was enough. Those are, those are tough jobs. So you sit down, in this case with Larry, and say, what are the problems that I can solve so that you can work on your problems. And what we ultimately iterated on was largely an external role, largely dealing with governments, uh, public issues, and so forth. Because frankly, we need the internal leadership focused on building great products. And that has worked very well. And I think it's a very, it's a very good long-term structure. Many tech companies are now getting executive chairmen to do precisely that, the, mystery, the inside and outside. There obviously are different approaches. Thank you so much. And we appreciate the relationship.